Today, I'm going to talk to you on this subject, the kind of church that God uses. The kind of church that God uses. So, we're going to be focusing in, the reason it says still waters, we're going to be focusing in on that phrase from Psalm 23, he leads me beside still waters. Now, what does that mean? He leads me beside still waters. Well, did you know that uh, uh, a sheep will drown if it does not have still water to drink from? In other words, if a sheep tries to drink out of fast-running water from a river, their wool will get soaked, and it will weigh them down, and it will actually drown them. And so part of a shepherd's job is to create still waters for the sheep, to create a, a, a peaceful environment, an environment where it is safe for the sheep to be able to drink water. We know that they cannot survive if they don't drink water. And so literally, when a shepherd is creating still waters, what are they doing? They are literally uh, investing in the life of the sheep. They're saving the life of the sheep. So today, we're going to be looking at uh, the first couple of verses from Psalm 23 and look at what God talks about in creating still waters. And I do believe this. It is a beautiful picture of salvation. When it says that he creates still waters for us or he leads us beside still waters, the idea is shalom. Now, you probably have all heard the word shalom. It's the Hebrew word for peace. But it means more than just tranquility or calmness. Uh, having shalom with God is a peace with God, but it's also the blessings of God in your life. It is a complete peace. It is a complete relationship with God, that He takes care of every area of our lives. And so our job as a church is not just to create less stress and a happy life for people, but it is to direct them to have peace with God. So the question then becomes this, how do we create still waters for people? Well, the metaphor for the church and our leadership is very strong. When the Bible says that our job is to create still waters or that God leads us beside still waters, this metaphor is very clear. Our job as a church, our job as individuals is to create still waters for the culture around us. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that uh, we don't preach or teach the truth of the Word of God because we just want everybody to come in and feel good? That's not what that means at all. In fact, if you do not teach truth, if you do not teach God's Word, you don't create any still waters. You just create another distraction in their lives. And what we know that people need is they need a relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't just need a distraction. So our job uh, is to be able to create still waters so that we, op we uh, have open arms to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, you may be familiar with our mission statement, which is bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me just kind of break that down for you. Bringing people. You know what our church is about? It's not about our four and no more. It's not about our traditions. It is about reaching people. It is about reaching you. It is about reaching your family. It is about reaching people who are not here yet. It is about reaching your children and your grandchildren. God has called us as a church to be able to reach into our community that is hurting around us. Next Sunday, I'm going to be talking about how we can minister to hurting people. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but the culture around us is hurting. There are people that struggle financially. There are people that struggle with their relationships, divorces, broken families, difficult marriages. We could go on. There are people that 
uh, struggle with addictions. And, and the fact is, as a church, you know what God has called us to do? He's called us to create still waters. We had our next step class this morning, and I was talking to them. How is it that when people have the greatest need in their life, the greatest hurts, the greatest failures, the church is the last place they want to go. Why? Because they feel judged by going into a place like that. You know what God has called us to do as a church? To create still waters so they can drink. Uh, Not just so they feel better about themselves, but because they need a relationship with Jesus Christ. Bringing people wherever they are, that's the open arms part. The fact is, a lot of Christians are good at throwing rocks. You ever notice that? We like to throw rocks at the people that look differently than we do, act differently than we do, think differently than we do. And that was never what Jesus did. We like to throw rocks. But what God has called us to do is not to be a rock-throwing church, but rather, rather a church that creates still waters where people can come and meet the life-transforming power of the Lord Jesus Christ, bringing people wherever they are, into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, none of this matters if we don't get to that part. Because if all we are is a place that teaches morals, did did you know this? Jesus did not come to make you moral. Now, I'm not suggesting you should not be moral. You should. When you become a follower of Christ, you should behave more and more out of a heart of love, not out of a heart of duty, but out of a heart of love to serve the Lord, okay? Uh, You should be moral, but Jesus did not come to make you turn over a new leaf. He didn't come to make you be a better person. He came to bring dead things to life. And that's why we exist as a church, bringing people, wherever they are, into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. One of the things we say here at this church is that your next step is your most important step. And that shows us that whether you are new to faith, your next step is baptism, whether you have been a Christian for a very long time, the fact is your next step is about what God is doing in your life right now. You know that I have next steps. I've been a Christian since I was eight years old. That's 49 years. Years And for you math whizzes, you know that makes me 57 years old. I've been a Christian since I was eight years old. Received Christ on my knees by my bed. My mother led me to Christ when I was an eight-year-old boy. And you know that even though I've been a follower of Jesus for 49 years, and even though I have been a pastor for 36 years, did you know that I have a next step? Every week of my life, I want to know what God wants me to do next. I want to follow Jesus. And in the same way, you and I have a next step. Our next step is our most important step. It's most important for you. It's most important for our church. That's why we're doing, that's why we're moving. If we wanted to keep the status quo, we wouldn't move. If we wanted to stay where we are, we would not move. Do you know why we're moving? Once again, is to reach people, is to be able to grow, is to be able to uh, empower our church to get to our home quicker so that we can reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ. We will not be satisfied until everybody within driving distance of this church knows Jesus Christ as their Savior. But if we're going to do that as a church, we've got to create still waters. Um, So what kind of church do we want to be? That's the question. What kind of church do we want to be? And I'll answer this. We want to be the kind of church that God uses. We want to be the kind of church that God uses. I want to read to you from Psalm 23 and the verse, the first three verses will begin in verse one. The Lord is my shepherd. You've heard this before. One of the most famous passages of Scripture there is. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. That word means I shall not lack. It doesn't mean that you don't ever want lunch or that you don't ever want to go to bed and have a good night's rest or that you don't want to have a relationship. That's not what it means. It means I will not lack. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm not going to lack anything. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. I love that. When it says he makes me, it doesn't mean he forces you. It means he leads you to this. When you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, a growing relationship with him, everything in your life changes. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. There, there's our theme. There's what we're talking about for the next few weeks. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You ever just get to that point where you need some restoration? You need a lift. You need a boost. You need God to show up in your life. You need help. That's what God says. He leads me. He restores me. And then it says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He doesn't do it because I need it. Oh, he loves me. Don't get me wrong. He loves you. But he doesn't do it just because of us. He does it for his namesake. What does that mean? Because that's who he is. Because he loves us. Because he is God. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. I want to give you very quickly. I won't be very long on these points. I know uh, when we start talking about the number of points, some people think, oh, no, this is going to be really long. It won't. It won't be. I've got six points that I want to give you. Bonnie laughed. All right, she thought that was funny, that it's good. See, you know, if you've been a Christian for a while, there's a couple things you know never to believe. The check's in the mail, and when a preacher says, this won't take very long, all right? But I promise it won't. Uh, Six characteristics of a church that God uses, and I want this to be characteristic of us. Okay, number one. They practice generosity. Notice it says, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, what does this mean? This means that it's very personal. So what if the Lord is a shepherd of lots of people that we don't know? It only matters if it's personal to you. The Lord is my shepherd. A church that follows what Jesus wants. You know what we do? We are generous with our time. We're generous with our service. We're generous with our efforts. Why? Because we realize that it's intensely personal. The Lord is my shepherd. If we're going to be the kind of church that God uses, we've got to reach people. We've got to share it with others. We do this through evangelism. But you know what I've learned about evangelism? That there are a lot of people that think the church ought to do this. You ever... Say, well, I'll tell you what y'all ought to do. Well, there is no such thing as that. If you're a part of this church, you know what that means? What we ought to do. Okay? So it includes you. We must be involved in evangelism and serving and being selfless and in giving. Why? Because that's the kind of church God uses. That's the kind of people that God uses. We practice generosity. Why? Because we know that the Lord wants to be the shepherd of those who are not here yet. Isaiah 40 verse 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms. Holding them close to his heart. Is that not a beautiful picture of what God wants to do in saving people? He wants to hold you close to your heart. Close to his heart. Every one of us needs that. People that are not in our church, people that are in our community, they need that. Why? Because we all have pain. We all have needs. God wants to hold us close to his heart. Ezekiel 34, 11, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. Did you know that God is seeking people? He's seeking people that need him. He's seeking people to save. He's seeking people to bless. And our job as a church 
is to practice the kind of generosity with our time, with our service, with our efforts that will help reach them with the good news. John 10 verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. What is the church to be about? It's not a social club. It's not a a closed off place. The church is a hospital for the sick. The church is a place to reach people. It's not a country club. It's not an exclusive membership. God says that our job is to take the good news to everyone everywhere. That's the kind of church God uses. We talk about inviting as evangelism. We have a responsibility to share the Lord is my shepherd. Here's the second characteristic. They believe in God's abundance. Now, I'm afraid that there are a lot of Christians that don't get this. He said, I shall not want. Did you know that the Bible, that God gives us hope and optimism and an abundance mentality? Now, what do I mean by an abundance mentality? It's the opposite of a poverty mentality. You know what the poverty mentality is? That there never will, there's never enough, there never will be enough, and there's no hope for ever to be enough. That's a poverty mentality. That's a negative outlook on life. That's a lack of faith. But you know what an abundance mentality is? That God is more than capable. That God is enough. That He is the one that provides for us. And that doesn't mean that Well, the pastor said I should have an abundance mentality. I need to go buy a new car this week. Now, if you get a new car, great. Good for you, all right? But what we mean is that we understand that God is the one who supplies our need and that because of him, there will always be more than enough. But there are a lot of Christians that don't act that way. And I'm not talking about just your finances. But they just don't think there's ever going to be any hope for this world. Let me, let me cut a little close here. You ever watch the news and think, there ain't no hope for them? I have to admit, I do. In fact, I try not to watch it too much because it makes me mad. Man, there's no hope for them. No hope for our country. Our country's going to hell in a handbasket. And the truth is, that is a poverty mentality. When we give hope and optimism and faith, you know what it does? It draws people to Jesus Christ because this world is looking for hope. And what God has called us to do is to have that kind of mentality that David wrote, I shall not want. I shall not lack. God is always enough. And he'll bless you. Uh, Listen to uh, Psalm 107, verse 9. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. There's more than enough. There's more than enough goodness. There's more than enough blessing. There's more than enough hope. And God has called us to be purveyors of hope. Not negative Nellies. Not the ain't it awful crowd. You you ever have that mentality? Well, it's just so bad. Ain't it awful? I grew up with that kind of mentality. Never was the idea to light a light, but rather, well, this darkness sure is bad, ain't it? Oh, it's so awful around here. It's so dark. Well, you know the cure to darkness? You know what it is? Turn on the light. It works every time. And God has called us to have that mentality. They believe in God's abundance. Here's a third characteristic of a church that God uses. They focus on Jesus. It says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. This is the idea of grace and sustenance and feeding and filling and satisfaction. Jesus said in John 10, 9, I am. Am the door, and I'm reading this from the Amplified Bible. I am the door. Anyone who enters through me will be saved and will live forever and will go in and out freely and find pasture. That's spiritual security. 
God has called us to be the kind of church that focuses on Jesus. You know, it's easy to focus on a lot of things. We can focus on money. We can focus on problems. We can focus on the culture. We can focus on all kinds of things. But you know what God has called us to do? He's called us to focus on Jesus. And when our focus is on Jesus, everything else is going to be okay. Everything else is going to be lifted. God has called us to focus on Him, on Jesus. Here's the fourth characteristic of a church that God uses. They embrace God's grace. It says there, He leads me beside still waters. God's called us to His grace. That's the picture. Still still waters is this picture of God's grace. We must have compassion and grace and love. God leads us. He does not drive us. And this is the thing. A lot of people don't realize this, uh, that when it comes to your relationship with Jesus Christ, God's not going to force you into anything. He's not going to beat you over the head. He's going to show you his love that he gave to us through Jesus Christ. And if that's not enough, then you won't respond. We need to have God's grace. That's why we say Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. We're creating still waters for people to come to church and to get to know Jesus. Psalm 16, verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. There are some Christians that need to read that verse every morning before they go to work, before they drive through traffic. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God has called us to be a church that embraces the grace of God. Here's the fifth characteristic of a church that God uses. They believe in second chances. He restores my soul. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you glad that God is a God of second chances? Now, I'll be honest with you, I was expecting a little bit more out of you, all right? I'm going to ask you again, because listen, when God gives second chances, He doesn't just end it there. He gives third chances, and fourth chances, and fifth chances, and 500th chances. God is a God of second chances. And and, and let me just tell you this. The longer you're a Christian, a follower of Christ, the longer you attend church, do you know that the the worse we tend to, the more critical we become in looking at other people. You know, when you first came to Christ, and there's some of you like this, when you first came to Christ, the way you looked, the way you dressed, the way you talked, it wasn't anything like what you should do when you come to church. You know what I mean? And you were welcomed here. But the longer we become a Christian, you know what we start to do? Well, I can't believe she would wear that to church. Did you see his hair? Did you see all of those tattoos on him? Let me just say something. If you got a tattoo, you're welcome here. All right? Now, the point is this. Not that you should get a tattoo, but nevertheless. If you want to, that's fine. We used to say... Uh, that if you wear a suit, you're a visitor at Avalon. If you have a tattoo, you might be on staff. All right, so. But our point is this. Don't miss this. The longer we become a Christian, the more difficult it is for us to embrace people's needs. We look at them and like, well, I can't believe they're living together. Well, I I can't believe, and, and you can fill in the blank with whatever it is that we think that they're doing wrong. And once again, it's not that we don't teach the truth of the Word of God. We do. We live by the truth because the only hope for people is the truth of the Word of God. But our job as believers and as a church is to believe that God is a God of second chances. We believe first uh, I'm sorry, uh, Philippians 1, six, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue it until it is finally finished. You know what that means? God's not finished with you yet. 
God hasn't given up on you yet. Yes, have you failed? Of course you have. Have you sinned? Of course you have. But God is not finished with you yet. The Bible says a righteous man falleth seven times and riseth yet again. And the point is this, God, our God is a God of second chances. And we must embrace that as a church because if we don't, we cease to be the kind of church that God uses Lamentations 3, it says, but I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Aren't you glad that our God is faithful? Aren't you glad that our God has mercy that is new every day? You know what kind of church that God uses? The kind that gives hope. The kind that has second chances. And then finally... I told you I wasn't going to be very long. They believe in life change. I I love the phrase there. He says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You see, we embrace the mess. We open our arms. We help people wherever they are. But you know what? We love you too much to leave you where you are. We love you too much to leave you floundering. We love you too much not to care about where you're headed. You see, he leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. For this reason, we never become discouraged. Even though our physical being is gradually decaying, yet our spiritual being is renewed day after day. And this small and temporary trouble we suffer will bring us a tremendous and eternal glory much greater than the trouble. For we fix our attention. Get it. Listen. Let it sink in. We fix our attention on who's in the White House. No, that's not what he said. We fix our attention on how much inflation is rising right now. No. We fix our attention on how our neighbors vote. They've got a sign in their yard that proves how they vote, and I don't like how they vote. That's not what it says. He says, we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen only lasts for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts for Ever, He says we need to get our mind off the temporary, the temporal, and get our mind on the eternal. And when we do, when we do, God changes us. And that's the kind of church that God uses. So here's the question. What kind of Christian are you going to be? What kind of follower of Jesus, what kind of church are we going to be? I pray that we will be the kind of church that God uses. Heavenly Father, help us to be used by you. Thank you for Jesus and all that you've done in our lives and all that you are doing and all that you're continuing to do. Thank you that by faith our best days are yet ahead of us. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Now, before we finish our prayer, I always like to give people an opportunity to respond. Maybe today you would say, you know, Pastor, I'm not sure of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, the good news is the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those of you online, those of you in the room, if you'd like to pray to receive Christ today, you can do it by saying something like this, praying something similar to this. Dear Jesus I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I am asking you to save me today. I'm asking you to give me that second chance that Pastor talked about today. I'm asking you to lead my life and change me forever. And I receive you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today, if you prayed to receive Christ then I would encourage you uh, to fill out the next step card. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, And today, 
if God spoke to you about the kind of person you should be, the kind of church God wants to use is made up of the kind of people that God uses. And we talk about the church, we're talking about you. It's us collectively. And, and I hope that today you'll pray about what God wants you to do. Okay. All right, now's the time for the big announcement that we promised you and everybody's been uh, tuning in about and everybody's nosy about and everybody wonders about. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a big thing. A number of years ago, about three or four years ago, our staff read a book. Um, and this concept of creating still waters started in us at that time. And we began to study Psalm 23. And we said, you know what? Our mission statement, this is exactly who we are. This is who we're striving to be, bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we began to create this kind of verbiage in our staff meetings. We began to talk about this with our elders. We began to uh, believe in this kind of philosophy. We already believed in it before, but it fit us perfectly. We began to talk about that as a church, we've got to create still waters. And that means that we have to look at it from a philosophical standpoint. We have to look at it from a practical standpoint. How do we practice uh, the ministries that we have? What do we do? Are we creating still waters? Are we making it easy for people to come into the church, to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, we really began to pray about this, and we really began to seek God. And over the past three years, God really began to do a work in my heart and in our staff's heart and in our elders. We've talked about this with our elders, and all of them agree. Every one of them is on board. And so the big announcement is this. We are changing our name from Avalon Church to Stillwaters Church when we move, when we move. Now, you say, why are we doing this? Well, for those of you who have been around for a while, you know that uh, several years ago when we moved here to this building, we changed our name from Horizon Point Church to Avalon Church. And you say, why did you do that? Well, the main reason... Just being really honest, it didn't have anything to do with philosophy. It had to do with an area. This area uh, is called Avalon, and we were on Avalon Parkway, and we felt like that it was a, a little bit better name than Horizon Point Church, and so we changed the name. Now, here's what we know. Avalon is a place. Stillwaters is a philosophy. Avalon is a location. Still waters is a mission statement. And so what God has called us to do and to be as a church is to create still waters. And that is who we are. That's who we are going to be. And so when we move, we're not going to start using that name until we move in July. Uh, but when we move... Our official new name is all going to be branded. It's all going to be a uh, new website uh, and everything. And for those of you that are old-fashioned and you still write checks, you're going to write a check not to Avalon Church, but to Stillwaters Church. You say, what if I write one to Avalon Church? We're still going to cash it, all right? So, so that is our plan. That is uh, what we're doing. So when we move to Strong Rock... You're going to see, we're going to be doing some advertising in the community and announcing that even though we're not a new church, we've got a new commitment to what God is doing in this place. We want to be the kind of church that God uses. Do you agree with that? Do you support that? Do you second that? Well, I'm excited about it. I'm excited. Now, if you don't like the name, that's okay. Okay, that's okay. I know that sometimes people like don't like change. And uh, if you want further explanation on why we're doing that, you can come see me, and I'm more than happy to talk to I've already talked to one person that found out, and they're like, I don't like it. I'm like, okay, that's okay. And you have permission not to like it, but I believe it is a beautiful name. I believe it's something that God is going to use. I believe that it's something that God's going to put fresh wind in our sails as a church and help us to be the kind of church that God uses. 
Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.